All right, welcome everybody. This is very loud. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm uh, Cécile Fromont. I teach in the um, History of Art uh, Department, African and Latin American Art and Expressive Culture. And I am so delighted uh, to be welcoming today Professor Ana Lucia Araujo, uh, who's coming uh, to Yale to present us her a fantastic new book, The Gift, How Objects of Prestige Shaped the Atlantic Slave Trade and Colonialism, in an event that is sponsored by the History of Art Department, the History uh, Department, and um, the Gilda Lemon Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at the Macmillan Center. And I'm particularly delighted that we could join uh, forces together to uh, make this, uh, this uh, event happen. Traditionally, in uh, the history of art uh, department, we begin with some words of an acknowledgement. Um, and today I will share to you the words that were uh, crafted by two of our doctoral candidates, Isabella Robbins and Ali Thomas, um, whose words I'm very happy to be uh, amplifying in this manner, in the spirit of the acknowledgements. And so they wrote, we would like to explicitly name the entangled catastrophes of settler colonialism and racial slavery, especially regarding this institution's material foundations and ongoing functions. Yale is named after a slave owner and built on the land that belongs to Mohican, Mashantuquet Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoc, Golden Hill, Pagauset, Niantic, the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquian speaking people. Today and every day, we honor Black and Indigenous people and our ancestors to whom Yale and all other settler institutions, which is to say monuments to white supremacy, owe the world. We encourage you to remain committed to reparations for racial slavery, sovereignty, and land back for all Indigenous peoples. And those words uh, by Isabella and Ali are particularly resonant today for um, the topic of our con conversation um, because of uh, Professor Araujo's long-standing uh, commitment uh, to the study and the critical approach to uh, some of his issues. Professor Araujo is a social and cultural historian writing transnational and comparative history, to say the least. Um, she's a full professor of history at the historically Black Howard University in Washington, DC. She was trained in Brazil, Canada, and France, and has a PhD in history and social and historical anthropology, as well as a PhD in art history. Um, her work uh, explores the history of slavery and the Atlantic slave trade and their present day legacies including the long histories of calls for reparation for slavery and colonialism. Her research also examines the memory, heritage, and visual culture of slavery. As many of you know, she's the author of many, many, many books and many, many, many more chapters and articles. Um, and maybe, you know, we can ask her about the secret recipe. Um, but more importantly, uh, uh, it, the content of a scholarship uh, has been uh, inspiring and really pushing the agenda uh, um, of many fields of research in different new and uh, urgent uh, directions. Uh, uh, expectingly, her work has been uh, um, recognized um, by uh, many prizes and uh, fellowships, most recently uh, at the Getty Research Institute and the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, she is also deeply engaged in public scholarship in the mainstream media, uh, as well as online um, and uh, through her uh, hashtag slavery archive digital uh, initiatives. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Ana Lucia Araujo, who's joining us today, and she will give uh, a short presentation of the book. We'll have um, a bit of a conversation. I have my talk show flashcards, um, and then uh, we'll be more than happy to open uh, the floor to uh, uh, your questions for those who are uh, with us in the room, as well as uh, our friends uh, online. So without further ado, um, welcome, Ana Lucia. Thank you. 
Thank you, Cecilia, for this uh, kind uh, introduction. And I would like to, um, to thank the Department of uh, History of Art, Department of History, the Gilder Lerman Center for uh, sponsoring this uh, event, and especially then to Michelle, and of course to Cecile. Uh, I'm very grateful that this is happening now. This book was out in Europe like uh, in November. Here in the US, it's just January. And especially these days, I really appreciate the opportunity of being in person with uh, real people talking about uh, scholarship. I think that we have been online for uh, far too long, then it's uh, a real pleasure uh, to be here. Then uh, this book uh, is about, uh, is I use the story of uh, a silver sword that was produced in France in the French slave trading port uh, of La Rochelle, uh, that was the second uh, most important slave trading port in France during the era of the Atlantic slave trade. And I use uh, the story of an object that is the object that is on the cover of the book uh, to tell the history then of how the French uh, engaged the Atlantic slave trade in West Central Africa. Uh, then in a region of West Central Africa that is indeed what we call the Loango Coast, which is uh, an area north of the, the Congo River uh, in West Central Africa, in a region that had some elements that are different from what happened, for example, in other slave trading ports in the area that were very important, such as Luanda and uh, Bengala. Because north of the Congo River, the Europeans, they were never able to establish, they were not allowed to establish a permanent uh, then trading posts. And uh, Africans in that area, then uh, they kept control of the, the slave trade until the 19th century when finally the Portuguese uh, and then the Brazilian as well took uh, control of uh, that era. And uh, the book also connects this region that has been studied separately by historians with another important region that was also a center for uh, the, the, the history of the Atlantic slave trade, that is uh, what we call the Bight of Benin. There is the region where the kingdom of the Homey was uh, located. And in this area, there were uh, then there was the second largest slave trading port after Luanda, that is uh, with that. Uh, and also other ports that were also uh, relevant during that period, uh, including Lagos in present-day Nigeria, and also Porto Novo, in which is present-day uh, Republic of Benin. The story of this object also connects then, then connects La Rochelle, connects uh, the Luanda coast and the Bight of Benin, but also Saint-Domingue, uh, which was then the, the most important uh, French colony in the Americas, uh, to where enslaved people who were uh, sold in then these areas, that is then in this area that was the, the Luangu coast, most of those were sold in that area. They would be transported by the French who were trading in that region to uh, Saint-Domingue that became uh, Haiti. Uh, the story of the object is a story then um, of uh, that has a connection then with the things that uh, Europeans they use to uh, purchase enslaved people. Some of these things, these articles were currencies that during the era of the Atlantic slave trade then uh, were uh, different kinds of things such as uh, textiles, uh, then iron bars, uh, cowrie shells, and uh, also some of these items, uh, alcohol and then uh, guns as well. Some of these items then over uh, as the, the slave trade developed and especially in the 18th century, which is the, the moment when the slave trade is the most uh, intensive then throughout uh, the Atlantic world. During that period, the, the Europeans, they were already um, giving to those who were African agents who were living along the coast, they were giving what you can call gifts to these uh, individuals in order to start the trade. These gifts have been examined by different historians of the Atlantic slave trade. I cite here uh, late Joe Miller, uh, a friend, uh, Mariana Cândido as well, and then we have Toby Green more recently. All these historians have uh, 
discuss the story of how gifts played a certain role in the Atlantic slave trade. But for most of them, for all of them, I would say that the, the story of the gift is the, the history of uh, tribute, that gifts were uh, conceived by these historians as tributes. And here is where the work of uh, historians like Cécile Fromont uh, uh, plays an important role because Cecile, in her previous work, then uh, the, the the book of 2014, and then in more recently, uh, then in other chapters, and then she has been examining material culture. But uh, Portuguese and Africans in the Kingdom of Congo, they were already exchanging diplomatic gifts. Uh, then, uh, for a variety of reasons, then in a then several centuries before the story that happens here took place. But here, the gifts are being exchanged not in the context of an attempt to convert these uh, this populations to, to Catholicism or to Christianity. They are not occurring in terms of uh, diplomatic uh, exchanges, but they are being given in order to obtain advantages in the trade of uh, enslaved Africans. Some of these gifts, of course, they can be conceived as tributes but there were other kinds of gifts that were being given during this time. And one of them is the one that I look in this, uh, in this book, which was a, uh, a gift that was especially, especially conceived uh, to be given to one of these agents, that is a man that in the sources is described as being uh, a man called Andri Pocuta, was the Mufuka, Mufuka being um, an office that existed then uh, in the kingdom of Ngoyo, that is on the, the Luangu coast, uh, and in specifically in the port of uh, Cabinda in what is present day Angola. And this man played the role of a middleman, uh, an intermediary. And uh, the, the entire story of about how this gift emerged is because uh, French traders had a conflict uh, in 1775. Uh, with uh, some of these uh, French traders attacking then another group of French traders from La Rochelle. And the Mufuka, which is the Minister of Commerce, as he described it in European sources, he ended up um, then uh, protecting the, the, the French traders from La Rochelle who were attacked. Then when they came back to La Rochelle, this sort was uh, then uh, commissioned and uh, in a then a voyage that took place, we calculate two years after the, the conflict, they gift this uh, article to, to this man, uh, Andri Pukuta. The story of the, the book, however, and I will finish here, the story of the book indeed it starts uh, because this item uh, ended up appearing in um, an auction in Paris in 2015. And uh, with the, uh, the auction, uh, when the, 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 the object was put on sale, in addition to the inscription, because we know that this was a gift to this man, Andri Pukuta, because there is a dedication engraved on the silver sword. But in addition to that, there was an ivory plaque that said that this item was a souvenir from the campaign of the Homey of 1892, meaning that this item was looted not from Cabinda, then the, the, the first destination, but was looted from Dahomey when the French took control, invaded and conquered uh, the kingdom of Dahomey. Then uh, it's uh, the, 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 the answer, the, 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 the question that I was trying to answer when I started writing this book was how this item ended up uh, in Abomey, the capital of the kingdom of Dahomey. Uh, then uh, and the book, of course, is this a story is a story about the French traders, the family of French traders, uh, then uh, in La Rochelle, also on the Luanda coast, and then their connections with um, with uh, Dahomey. And uh, I try to see then how this object, which is an object, is not a document, is not a written document, which is usually what historians uh, they examine, how the object itself became a sort of archive of all these exchanges. Because at each uh, new recipient, to some extent, 
uh, each new recipient left uh, uh, a mark on the object. Of course, that there is a lot of speculation in the book. There are uh, questions that I am not able to answer, and there are several ifs. But uh, what I did was uh, I, I tried to explore each of the, the possibilities, uh, which is something that historians uh, they don't like. Uh, but art historians they accept that, and then uh, I decided that this was uh, a good way of uh, dealing with um, this enigma. And the book then uh, opens up to several different uh, threads. Uh, some of them, of course, that are not uh, fully explored. Uh, but I hope that those who are in the room working on connect fields will be taking some of these threads and perhaps uh, discovering um, new stories that deserve to, to be told. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I, we're recruiting here. <laughs> That's uh, new historians. Um, and it's, it is a very generous book in this regard, right? That it's um, uh, really giving many uh, avenues for further research. Um, and um, in, in that, you know, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, the ways in which you're bringing that idea of the gift, which is uh, obviously a, a term that has a historiography of its own, and it's loaded uh, with uh, different uh, types of theorization, and then bringing it to the context of the slave trade with its own um, its own history, right, of um, uh, uh, analysis, and in particular its own kind of dimension of the objectification um, of human being that is at the core of it. So uh, how do you think about that process of writing um, a biography of an object that is part of the slave trade that is about you know, objectification of um, people? Yes, uh, I think it's, uh, it's an excellent question because I, I still believe that historians, they didn't pay that much attention to, to material things. And uh, the entire history of the Atlantic slave trade is about uh, purchasing people with things. And uh, the object itself was an object to be held by an individual, to be displayed. Then there is a, a level of... Uh, that is not an object that is just to, to remain static, but the story of this kind of uh, sorts of prestige was then to convey a message, to be held by a certain, then first the, the, the king, and then the agents of, uh, of the king. Um, then this is one component, but I think that the, the, the component that uh, is important, perhaps that we should think more about is uh, the importance of uh, these things more than just the, the quantitative uh, approach, then what was being exchanged, and I think that your work uh, shows this clear, uh, clearly, is uh, what was being exchanged matter. It mattered for Europeans who were uh, giving these gifts, and it matters uh, also for uh, Africans on the other side who were um, than getting this, these articles. But uh, all this idea of gift that has, of course, a long uh, trajectory coming from antiquity, usually historians have, and even anthropologists have approached the, the gift as a sort of a contract that put the receiver in a sort of position of inferiority that uh, would lead to a sort of uh, reciprocity. And I think that here is, it can be the case, but I, uh, I think that the objects of this kind that were conceived specifically to be given to a person who had his specific tastes, that when this object was commissioned, we can imagine that uh, these European traders were on the coast, that they, uh, they knew the tastes of this man, that they saw similar objects like these, and that when they came to La Rochelle, they said, I would like to have something that looks like this and with some of these elements because this will please these uh, individuals. 
Uh, then uh, I think that when you enter that zone, is a zone that is much more complex than the idea of just the, the, the contract, uh, because the object is not static, the object is moving beyond those who gave and who received it. And also the object itself changes. Uh, the object, there are several layers that are being added to the object because this is something that is particular to silver as well, that silver in, in general can be melted and transformed into something else and uh, can be amended. Um, and this is what Africans, they were doing with other silver objects, but they uh, it was being done also with uh, this kind of uh, object here. And I don't know if this long rambling yes. here. Uh, yes, answer. it's uh, super interesting. And I... You know what? What, um, what is really uh, striking is that, of course, the one of the gesture of the book is a, a corrective, right, to some um, uh, you know ideas about the the slave trade in which you know the uh, uh, enslaved uh, captives are exchanged against, like uh, you know, uh, things of little value, which is kind of uh, one of the um, uh, very long lasting and almost inaugural kind of tropes in uh, European writing about uh, about the slave trade. Uh, and in this case, it, it's a great example because it's a beautiful um, big silver object uh, that is kind of like Rococo French um, uh, silversmithing. And it's basically those uh, slave traders from La Rochelle who are thinking, what do I give to somebody who has everything? Right, because he has a collection of, you know, he has access to um, to everything that he wants, and they come up with like this uh, really exceptional object, um, and so that helps us see the ways in which um, you know power and status were you know negotiated and uh, uh, very much embattled on the coast uh, uh, itself. And as much as I love that story, there's the parallel story of the crown that uh, comes from the British context and is uh, destined uh, to, um, you know, to basically the same itinerary to, you know, be given as a gift. And it's an imitation of the uh, crown of uh, the King of England. And it has like shiny stones and it's uh, a kind of golden uh, metal. But it's not gold, and it's not, um, and it's not uh, a precious stone, and um, that kind of it's almost a counterexample to uh, to the uh, to the sword from uh, from Luongo, right? Uh, yes, yes, is is true. Uh, I think that one of the interesting uh, elements about that uh, crown, that the crown that uh, Cecilia is referring to is a crown that is today at the Heights Museum in uh, Amsterdam. This was given then by uh, the, the, the English were going to give to a king of the kingdom of Alada in what is present day Republic of Benin. The ship was intercepted by the, by the English who took, uh, by the Dutch, sorry, who took that, uh, gift that never reached the, the receiver then today the, the, the gift is there. And it's an imitation that is inspired of that uh, of that crown. And I remember that when I was writing the book, the way that I was addressing that uh, that crown was like, yes, or in, in terms of cheap, the, the, the materials were cheaper than the, the gold and the precious uh, stones that uh, were in the original crown. But then, uh, uh, one of the readers, I will not say her name here, uh, the, 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 one of the readers, uh, <coughs> a, a, a colleague who read the manuscript asked, well, but for Africans, then uh, copper brass had, uh, had, uh, had a symbolic value, despite not being silver, for them it still was something that, uh, that was valuable. And here we have this one, however, this, this object, we have both, both dimensions. On the one hand, it's a beautiful object that mixes elements that perhaps objects that we can find uh, uh, then in, in France in the 18th century, but at the same time incorporates uh, local formal elements. And it's silver, which was then an important uh, valuable metal in France. And it was also a valuable metal then, of course, uh, for Africans, but to this extent, it's it's rare. And I would say that uh, even today, I still, 
it's an object that is beautiful. Like I think that it, still today I, I look at this and I still find that this uh, a beautiful uh, object that I am not tired of it. And I often think like that back in the time uh, that this may have made a, uh, an impression and that people would talk about this object when it reached the, the coast because it's uh, different from from then the local um, local uh, articles and all their other articles that Europeans perhaps would be giving us uh, as gifts then um, I think that there is uh, an interesting dialogue here to think about yeah and I, I... In a way, it comes into play with uh, a long and against uh, the kind of long lasting ideologies that are being put in place to create difference, right? And, and, and distance between uh, Africans and Europeans. And part of it is, um, you know, the discourse saying that Africans don't understand very well the value of things, right? Which is, um, uh, of course, cynical, but it's also uh, serious in the intellectual history. Uh, of Europe, and these are examples that you know invites us to at least um, uh, take it with a grain of salt, or really kind of seriously uh, address this. And what is really striking is that in the creation of that object and in the creation of the crown, also it is that reckoning about oh, what would they like? Um, mm -hmm. And um, one um, one word that I think doesn't come up in the book, but that you know. Uh, uh, was on my mind as I was reading is that um, idea of intimacy um, between the traders and the rulers on the African coast, but also the ways in which um, those networks that are familial networks and networks of uh, information are so close knit from one ship to the other. And that's really what makes the book like a telenovela. You're like, who the brother of who did what when and uh, so for example the silversmith is that made the sword is the brother of a slave trader captain and etc uh, etc et so there is kind of that dimension of all of that distance and all of those rifts in terms of oh we don't understand each other we're not the same we're different they don't understand and yet it's so intimate yes Yes, yeah, so it's, it's an important dimension that you bring because uh, this was happening on, uh, on the Luando coast and also in La Rochelle that these were both uh, slave trading ports then uh, the Cabinda and uh, La Rochelle. But in both places, we had this these networks. Then in La Rochelle, of course, these slave merchants, they were uh related then the, the ship captains they were marrying uh, then uh, the, the 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 daughters of uh enslaved traders those who were outfitting these ships also those uh, who were the, the surgeons of these ships or who were who occupied other um then roles in this in these voyages they were all related and then this in the small communities where people they they knew each other then this was happening on the, 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 in La Rochelle. But then the same individuals, they were coming to the Luango coast where uh, the ports were also very close, where the communities were small. And in the case of this man to whom they gave this gift, um, when the conflict uh, happened, they, uh, they took refuge in his uh, home. Then the sense of intimacy enters here. They were in his house. And in his house, you can imagine that they saw other objects, that they learned about his tastes. And uh, uh, also another dimension that uh, perhaps for, for specialists, this is something that is a given. But even me, I, I, was, I am not always thinking about the fact that this man, uh, they were spending several months uh, on, the, on the coast. They, they were learning some of the language. Some of them, they became interpreters and uh, they were coming back. And they, they were coming back several times. Then the, 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 the ship captain, when he brought this, he made several uh, voyages to that region. And sometimes they were coming back and then the next uh, voyage was to the, the Bight of Benin. Then they were having this double connection um, and 
that there was here this sense of intimacy that we don't think about because uh, they were spending all this time on the post and they were learning a lot about this um, this uh, this middleman. Yeah, and that's a, um, a really a testament of how these kinds of stories, right, uh, are operating at the intersection of um, uh, perhaps ideas about the silences of the archive versus the fullness of the archive, and then perhaps also the selective deafness of um, um, scholars to uh, what this sum total of sources have to say. And um, I, I, you know, your book is really a template in bringing those elements together to tell a richer story with a lot of elements that have been into play, but you know, didn't really fit together. Um, and in, I was wondering, in the development of the book, did you um, did you have that clear idea from the beginning that oh, this is what the book will operate, or um, is it a story that emerged more from kind of the research into the uh, into the objects or into the methodological possibilities? Yes, this uh, this is an excellent question because. Um, it changed uh, as uh, I did uh, research. It, it depends always on the way that, uh, the way I work is that I am doing research, I am reading and I'm writing at the same time. Uh, the book in the beginning was supposed to be bigger than longer. And uh, in the beginning when I started looking at this object uh, because it, it started elsewhere, when I, start, when I decided to do work on this, my idea was that the object perhaps would move towards the 19th century to, to, to the Bight of Benin. But the sources started speaking at some point uh, that I, I realized that more probably this object uh, moved um, than was carried to the Bight of Benin by the same people who gave him them, the same people, not exactly the same people, but, but by the same French traders. And uh, one element that perhaps we should emphasize as well is that the Atlantic, the, the French slave trade uh, really is going to stop or dramatically decline with um, the Asian uh, Revolution then starting then in 1791. And this uh, occurs then just before the, the, the revolution then 1775, uh, 1775, 1777. And it's indeed, uh, then I realized that it was everything more or less took place at, at, at in, in that span of uh, sort of uh, twenty years as the sword moved to uh, to this um, to this other region, and this is something that I didn't have an idea that it, it would move uh, that way. Of course, perhaps someone is going to find in the future uh, documents that will then uh, take down this, uh, my, my hypothesis. I would love that people find documents that would show that perhaps something else occurred or something that would explain what happened during the entire uh, 19th century. But um, I had to, to think about. And one of the things I, I, I remember that at some point by there is that travel account by Louis de Grandpré that you worked on in the, the your first book. And reading that, because this man, he went there to this region when he was, a, his father was already a slave trader. Then he uh, attended, then he saw the, the funeral of the, the Pukuta, the one who got the, the gift. But at some point I told myself, yeah, it, it looks like a story that the same people who gave the, the gift took it back after the recipient, uh, the receiver died. And uh, this is something that, the, of course, I cannot go in, in, into more detail, but it would make sense in the sense that if I try to put myself in that place, yeah, you give a valuable gift, which is very special, and that person dies, and then you take that back to give it to someone else, which is something that is a taboo we did to do that. Like we don't, you are not supposed to take back something that you gave. But uh, I already saw in families, for example, especially after people die, that we have situations in, that people trying to take things back 
especially when a person is deceased, um, then yes, um, it's a, a story that changed as um, as I uh, was uh, writing. And there is a lot uh, about the story that is, I mean, depending on how you read it, you could think that it's hypothetical, but also uh, on the contrary, you could think that it is, you know, no stones unturned, right? Because you're looking at different scenario. Mm -hmm. And after all, that is probably one of the most kind of impactful um, uh, legacy of the book, right? That it kind of shows different directions in which you can, you know, you can go and do research about um, with the objects. Um, and one of the revelations I think that comes through following the object, even though it is, you know, very strange that it ends up in Dahomey, having been in uh, West Central Africa, is perhaps that notion of French slave traders being perhaps intermediary, go between two different parts of the uh, African Atlantic coast. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, uh, it's, it's true. Um, and I, I would say that there is, uh, and perhaps there is a thread here to, to follow also that other, uh, perhaps there were other objects from these areas that ended up uh, in these places because these individuals were going back and forth uh, to different to different locations, and I and I think like I I haven't this is the only book I did like is following one object that is uh, focusing much more on uh, material culture and by using all these ifs that historians they don't like. Uh, then some historians they would say now like if you don't have something in writing somewhere saying that this is what took place but here I had to to, to work with this uh, possible um, trajectories for for the object but I think that, that there would be work to be done uh, that I, I think that this is what material culture perhaps can contribute to the, the work that we do as historians for art historians you work in a way that is much more, uh, it's in a way that is freely, that, that you are going to consider all these this possibilities uh, with only based on what you are seeing. Whereas historians, they do not work that way, but I think that historians have, have a lot to learn uh, by and to enrich their works if they also, in addition to the written evidence, that if they consider this, uh, these objects that have a dimension that the, the written record do not have because this sword was touched by the man who uh, created, who manufactured. It was touched by those who transported. It was touched by the, the receiver. Then th there is an element that is alive that, it, uh, that in an object like this, that the written record that is buried in the archive and uh, mediated by us uh, do not have. And I think that this is the, the beauty of uh, being able to, to engage this kind of objects. Yes, thank you. I wanna give a, a chance to um, uh, everybody to ask a question if uh, you have it, but maybe while you gather your thought, I will ask one more um, and then uh, uh, open it up. And it's, um, about uh, uh, um, bouncing back on what you were just saying, that one of the theorization that you use is that of the speaking object, right? Mm -hmm. And that it is, you know, it is true in multiple ways in the book that it is a speaking object because of the um, the inscriptions on it, mm -hmm. but it also because it is um, uh, a technically a tool for oral messages, right? Oral mm -hmm. history being passed uh, within the context of the African continent, and then of for scholars, it is also a speaking object, right? Mm -hmm. That it's kind of the key to um, to a lot of that. Yes, and there are so many speaking objects to look at because there are other items than for people who are working on the connections, for example, with uh, indigenous populations uh, here in the United States, uh, other silver items like these that have been uh, exchanged, even up to the, the recent period because uh, then Presidential collections, for example, are full of objects that were uh, exchanged and including by African uh, uh, then presidents and uh, rulers who gave this to, to, to these uh, presidents here in the US uh, and elsewhere. 
then um, I think that there is an interesting avenue because there, there, are, there is written words in objects too. It's not only a metaphor. The object itself has something in writing. And for any historian who say that this is not a written source, uh, it's not true because it is. There is writing and there is writing in French and possibly writing in uh, in Kikobo, uh, that through the, the, the symbols that uh, are on the on the sword. Yes, thank you. Are we gonna use the mics? For I think if people? you, I, I'm told that the room will listen. Oh, that too, yeah. So, all right, let's believe them. Um, so this week in, in, in uh, uh, one of my classes, uh, we are looking at that HO, battle between the macroscopic and the microscopic, the mm -hmm. macro history and the micro history. Uh, and of course, uh, you mentioned Toby Green, and of course, how he helps us understand that we cannot understand the rise of capitalism without understanding the exchange of cowrie shells. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna put him on the microscopic side. So <laughs> he also looks like three centuries, right? Like, and then, and then, uh, and, and the cowrie shell itself is an object that then loses its own distinctness because it's just too many of them and they all just, and they're circular and they're, they become sort of standardized, like currents. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of that equation, let's put it on the micro side, let's put this sword and other objects of prestige, like the sword that are understood to be so unique. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet they share something, which is they have uh, they derive a lot of their value through a history of exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, and you look at this history of, this, uh, of, of exchange, it's a micro history of this one particular object. But as you were doing this work, I wonder if your mind sometimes conceptually took you in that other direction and try to come up maybe with, a, with, with some concepts about how the exchange perhaps within Africa, this one is weird because this one goes European to African to European, like, like a take, like, uh, a horse a, a gift like give it back like you know mm -hmm. this kind of thing but i can also think about like the exchange within african rulers or certain objects that you probably have encountered uh, and, you know like certainly have encountered and about whether one could talk of economies at a slightly, slightly larger scale when it comes to these objects of, of prestige and if this kind of helps us set a, a different conceptual territory for understanding that that sort of economy uh, separate from the cowrie shell uh, argument. Um. Yeah, it's a um, it's an excellent question, Alex. Um, I think that yes, um, uh, that that I I I pretty much focus on. Then I was trying to 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 think about this this broader uh, questions and this dialogue with the problem of uh, is this currency? Is this tribute? Is this a gift? But the material, the micro, the the in the, the the macro but in the book i keep like that sort of uh, thread focus on uh, on one object but the dimensions that you bring they are there especially i would say at the moment when there, there are these interactions that are visible through uh, then things that were created uh, with what Europeans would bring, for example, the silver coins that would be melted and sometimes even uh, added to some of the, the jewelry, for example, that was uh, uh, manufactured uh, in the home. Then I think that Africans they were doing that all they were doing that all the time. That they were, and especially in the home. And I think that the work that Suzanne Blier uh, has been doing in El Boja, uh, on the home has shown that that they were they could basically create anything with uh, that they would see an object that was bringing by a, a European trader and that they would create something uh, that would be similar to that and also because they would uh, wage war against other uh, neighboring societies and they would bring this stuff even. Uh, gods, even babies, they would bring and adopt those, uh, then why, uh, if they were doing that, uh, and if they were bringing people and incorporating those people as their dependents in these societies, they were doing 
similar things with uh, these objects. And this is why, like, at the beginning, uh, at some point, I think that our discussion season that we have in social media, that uh, micro history, okay, this is a micro history. And someone said, oh, this is a micro history. They said, no, I don't want that term micro history because at the end, I think that diminishes what we are doing in, in, in terms of the of this sort of small scale. And this is when uh, at the introduction, at the, I ended up incorporating the, the work of uh, Francesca Tricalato when she refers to this idea of the, the micro history at a global uh, scale because it's too broad to just be micro history. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk and for the discussion. Um, it like occurs to me that we can think about this silver sword in a couple of different ways. So we can think of it as an instrument that local leaders are deploying, that European slave traders are deploying um, in different ways to consolidate social relations. Um, as war booty, um, but we can also think of it um, drawing on a little bit about what you were talking about with the speaking object as an object that has power in itself and has a sort of agential quality to it. You were talking about how beautiful it seems to you mm -hmm. and how surely it must have seemed beautiful and exercised this visual power upon a lot of people who handled it and used it over centuries. Um, yeah, like this is this sort of duality is something that I'm interested in in my research, and I was wondering how you contend with that in the book, um, and if so, how? Yes, yeah, so like I, I, I think that um, then the first the, the first chapters of the book that the book starts like uh, on the Luangu coast, goes to La Rochelle, then the, the goes back to the Luangu coast where this conflict took place, and then the object itself. Is then towers then the the, the 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 final chapters of the book in which uh, I, I I do this analysis and it could be much broader because there are other objects that uh, in that area that are in dialogue uh, with this one then I would say for example the the pot leads that uh, are created in Caminda that are everywhere in Belgium and in Portugal as well that are that also have these proverbs and could convey a, a message. Uh, there are other similar ones that were created and in the 19th century that there is an entire story to be developed on that and also objects that were done similar to this one but were made locally of other materials. And uh, of course, I, I, I try to, to take all that into account, but in a way that in, to a great extent was also intuitive that I would uh, try to, to respond to all this. Uh, but I, I don't think that it was exhaustive, which is why I think that it, there is still a lot of work to, to be done on this object. Uh, for example, even if you think in terms of what happened during the 19th century, then there is not, uh, then there was more that could have been done. And even the, the object has a life now because it, it is exhibited in, in, in La Rochelle. Then there is something to be done on that too. And also with all the other siblings and cousins and uh, children of this, uh, this one, uh, then uh, yeah, like it's a, a work that doesn't have uh, doesn't have an end, and which is also part of this this work because I did a lot of work on memory, and memory is something that is changing all the time. And then at some point, when you are writing a book of this kind, you have to say, okay, now I have to stop because it's every week there is something new happening. And here it was also at what I decided to do, like, yes, yeah, like, I think that this is going to be uh, enough, but there is a lot to, 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 to be done. Can you make a comment? I, I have often thought that in, in setting history of places that are exotic to me anyway, and, and times that are older too, that, um, you know, you'd read about the Hittites and you'd read about these people who came back with, and it was like overwhelming. And I think, or for example, just right, every few years, I, I look up the difference between the his, who the Sunnis are and who the Shias are. But I don't remember after a few months. Mm -hmm. I have to look it up again. You know, whose grandfather, and, and, and to have a culture, to have this history illustrated 
rather than describe. I mean, with, with our objects, it would make it, I think, a whole lot more relatable as from first from a student's point of view. Yes, this is an excellent idea for a digital project then to be done. Like uh, we could connect all these uh, all these uh, similar objects and uh, talk a little bit about the, the people as they moved uh, across these different places and so on. And I, I totally agree with you, even for me, like I, I try to write this in a way that is uh, as clear uh, as possible. But I can understand that, especially when you are writing about uh, then, uh, the African continent, and even for a, a North American audience, if you are talking about France, mm -hmm. that is something that even the names and everything is, is hard to, to, to get, uh, which is why I try to, to, to be clear. But this is a problem. But I think that we should not stop doing that because we need to write histories of Africa that are uh, accessible uh, to people. And uh, like this, we are going to have more people who will be interested in that. But here we have another idea that there is a history that can be done only through images here with uh, these objects. Hi, um, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I had a question around um, the materiality of your sources. Uh, I know that you're speaking about a sword, but was there a particular way that you were writing this where writing about a sword was different than writing about a painting from the same period or writing about a uh, sort of a type of object that doesn't have, have a name? So I was wondering if there was something particular about a sword, the mobility of a sword and how it can be used, whether it's for ceremony versus a painting and how you were writing. Thank you. I think that there are elements that are similar because it's still when you are uh, examining a painting, then you are looking at color, then the, you are looking at different formal elements, you are looking at things that are represented that you are trying to, to connect with, for example, uh, with existing objects. There are elements that are similar. I, I would say that the difference is that, of course, this uh, object uh, was moving and it was an object that was made to be manipulated, which is not what is the case of a painting. <coughs> Forgive me if I am saying a stupid thing here, but a painting is still to be to be seen. It's not uh, something that is to, to something to be touched or carried. Um, and I, I think that here is the is the difference that I, I will have to consider all these uh, these dimensions and also the cross cultural uh, dimension because it's one single object that carries different parts and things that were amended. Then, uh, if you compare to a painting, perhaps the layers of a painting. Then the, it, it happens sometimes that we discover a painting and then when people then uh, well restore a painting that they discover a layer that is underneath that was unknown. Uh, I think that this object carries that. Uh, but there are many elements that are similar. And I think that we should think uh, of, of all these, either the written sources uh, and a visual source like a painting in an object like this. I think that there are many elements in when we are doing the analysis of them that uh, we can you can use. Uh, and you should not be shy in doing that. Uh, and this is how perhaps you can uh, connect these uh, methodologies that otherwise would be hard to, to be done. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the work. This is really fascinating. Um, you just made mention of the fact that the sword had been amended, the materiality of it. I've and I'm curious if that's the case, since you were tracking its circulation over space and time, is there a history to be told, and maybe you do have read it, but is there a history to be told about those amendments articulating different notions of prestige over time? Um, See what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, then uh, of course, that that are part of this, that is, uh, there are uh, hypotheses that I, that I raise, but uh, the, the idea is that uh, when some of the, the amendments were made, they were made uh, in the home, 
and uh, they were made in order to re-empower the object uh, locally. Then um, that the, this conversation is uh, some, somewhat there. Then there is the, the, the inscription in French, but there are also then these geometrical symbols that uh, had meaning then locally on the Luangu coast, but also had meaning in, uh, in the home. And this associated with the uh, local religion, then the Vodun religion, then some of these uh, the symbols, they are in conversation uh, with what was going on there. Then uh, the idea of amending is uh, somewhat um, to re-empower the object, to give new meaning for the, the new people who, who were holding the, the object. Thank you so much. And I, I would love to hear you elaborate more on how you really use this concept of gift to carry your story forward because the, it's gift has this really enigmatic double meaning of seemingly it's a voluntary act. And yet there is this deeply compulsory um, aspect of it. And you know, gift has this on surface that generous act of parting what you possess, but there is also this you know, to use that concept to talk about slavery, which is so much about taking or you know, forcing somebody to give their life and labor. He's just a just really enigmatic way of using that concept that I, I would love to hear more about how you are using this double sword meaning of the gift to talk about the history of slavery through this object. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kiko. Um, like, I know then for anthropologists and the anthropologists in you, the gift is a big institution, which I do not, uh, then of course that we have to, how can I say, to reckon with this very long tradition of uh, studying the gift. But from a very simple point of view, uh, the term gift, uh, and this would in French be uh, uh, the, then in, in French or in whatever language, then it would appear in the documents and even in the tables of trade that these were gifts. In the sense that you were saying that, uh, then in some cases as tribute and carrying that compulsory dimension that is the tradition, traditional view that in anthropology uh, the, the idea of gift will have. But I think that this work here, despite being modest and not trying to make an intervention uh, in, uh, in uh, anthropology, I, I think that this brings a, a, a new dimension to this, uh, this compulsory dimension of the gift as anthropologists uh, have uh, been seeing. Because in this context, people, they became curious that this is what uh, others have written. Then people are still people, but in that economy, they, they are being ex exchanged uh, for things. For, and, and this is when even people could be given as then Africans were given people as gifts. Uh, that this is a discussion that I, I have also in the in the in the introduction uh, of the book. Then, uh, in the in, in the in the context of the Atlantic slave trade, gifts can be things and can be people as well. And we have to break that sort of uh, idea that I understand that when you don't study that, it can be shocking to see how. People are commodified in this in the sources. Uh, even if in the book I am not looking at the victims of the Atlantic slave trade, this man who got this, he is an agent who was uh, a slave trader, an, an African slave trader. Let's say that way. Um, then it's a dimension that goes beyond uh, 
the dimension of those who are sold uh, in exchange for the advantages that this man uh, on the coast uh, got then uh, you have to, to, to read the book to see if you agree with me or not, uh, or if I did well my job uh, regarding the, the discussion of the, 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 the institution. But of course, it's a, a modest. Uh, then I, I didn't, despite the title of the, 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 the book, it's not that I'm trying here to, big, uh, to make a big intervention on the, uh, regarding the institution that is for anthropology. Uh, maybe we can take one last question. Um, yeah. uh, thank you so much for this fascinating work. And I, I remember, I think that you started by saying that the object was put up for auction in Paris in 2016. Is that right? 15. 15, 2015. And I wonder if you could tell us more about how that came about. Why 2015? It seems like it's a moment when objects are being contested, who's owning them, who wants to keep them, where to put them. Why do you think this arrived in Paris at the auction in 2015? Yes, like, um, thank you, Laura. Thank you, and nice to see you uh, in person after so many years. Um, then I, I don't, there are, uh, the, the answer is uh, I, I don't really know. What I do know is that it was um, a, a descendant of this officer, the French officer who looted the object in 1892, then a descendant passed then through several generations. And this descendant was a woman indeed, as far as I know, uh, offered the, the object uh, for sale. And it was not the only object. There are uh, setters, um, one that uh, then one at least that is in ivory that is now uh, in Republic of Benin in a new museum that was created there that had the same ivory, ivory black, and it was put on sale uh, at that time because the descendants of these men who participated in these campaigns back in the time, they kept almost uh, house museums uh, with the, the relics, the souvenirs from, from these campaigns. Then I believe that it was basically a, a financial motivation that at some point uh, the, the, the descendant decided to, to sell. Uh, another colleague who did work on this issue that is Gael Bojan who visit the, the, the houses where these descendants kept some of these objects, then some of these objects are there in their houses it's still today and were not put on sale. Then uh, it, it's something that uh, is still going on. And I was not able to, to follow the, the descendant because I contacted the Hossein uh, auction house back in the time. I uh, had an exchange with uh, the person who did the research for uh, the, the auction because part of the elements of this story uh, emerged with the auction and to tell to sell the object and say that it was valuable they had to, to cover the, the story um, and, and the Museum of La Rochelle also did uh, some research uh, on that uh, but uh, back in the time what he told me is that I would have to talk with the lawyer of the uh, Hossein uh, auction house and then I didn't want to <laughs> I just want to do my research I didn't want to enter the lawyer uh, world and then I left that, then perhaps someone will be able to do it at some point because they cannot reveal then uh, perhaps who knows if the, this person is still alive or some descendant and if they see the book uh, somewhere that they will decide to, to, to come out and uh, let us know uh, a little bit about the, the life of this object during the 20th century. Great. Let's have the last word though uh, from a Zoom question perhaps. Uh we have several questions. I'll just uh, pick one of them, but lots of accolades and thank you for the talk. Um, so here's a question. Um, I'm curious that because this began as an investigation into an object that could be repatriated, repatriate, I wonder if you could speak to how the return of objects to Africa will impact or even force people to confront the involvement and culpability of African tribes in the transatlantic slave trade. I guess, do you see, <laughs> small question. Do you see your work as an intervention into contemporary political circumstances in Africa? 
Um, um, I would say that um, I have several um, <laughs> reserves regarding some uh, of the terms of tribes. These were not tribes, then these was uh, uh, these were states. The, then the Ingoyo that was the the, the king then from to where uh, this object. Uh, was headed uh, back in the time and the homey they were not tribes these were states with armies and with officers and uh, well structured uh, then uh, the, the problem with this object here of course that the repatriation is a good question it would be repatriated uh, to where uh, and do we have any demands to repatriate this to somewhere uh, not that i know and my my work uh, like past work uh, has had this goal of making some kind of intervention, but it's pretty much what people who read this want to do with this work, with people who are uh, demanding repatriation, they want to read this work, and if this is going to be useful for them, uh, it's great. Uh, but what I do as a historian is uh, to study these things, and hopefully they will have an impact, probably they will have no impact, and uh, I have uh, to live uh, with that because this is the profession that I decided to <laughs> to choose. Uh, then hopefully there is an impact, but um, it, it it's not something that was done with um, this first intention at least. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.